welcome to In Conversation. Um, everyone out there, my name is James Campbell. I'm going to be asking some questions on behalf of Intellect Books and Journals. Um, we're here today with BJ, who is a translator, um, an activist, a doula, an author for our imprint, Hammer On, and we're also celebrating the work of Hammer On this week. So I do urge you to go and check them out online too. Um, a mother, you you don many hats, that's for sure. So thank you for giving us some time today. I do really appreciate it. Um, so thank you for having me. No, it's our pleasure. So first of all, where where are you calling in from? So I'm in Norwich, England. Yeah, to the east of England. East of England, and what what is it you do there? Well, I know you do many things there, but it's what what took what brought you to Norwich? I I moved to Norwich originally so that I could teach at the university. So I'm an academic at the University of East Anglia. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah, I know her well, and <laughs> I'm, I'm sure many of our authors do too. Um, but how did you end up moving to Norwich in the, originally? Because I, I know you've got a more interesting story than that. So where are you originally from? How did you, how did you make it across the sea? I grew up in Chicago, and at 17, I left Chicago and uh, moved to Philadelphia to get my bachelor's degree. From there, I rather randomly ended up living in Sweden. Um, I'd met somebody Swedish, and I thought, well, this is going to be an adventure. Um, and I just really fell in love with Swedish as a language, Swedish culture, Swedish literature. It was very different from what I was used to growing up in America. And I became a teacher and a translator. And after some years of that, I felt that I wanted to move on. I'd gotten a master's degree during that time. And I moved to Wales, to Swansea, to do my PhD which is in the field of literature known as translation studies. So I analyze how books are translated. And after that, I got the job at UEA, uh, and I've been teaching literature and translation there since 2009, which I almost don't want to admit because it makes me feel a little bit old. <laughs> oh, well, that's great. Well, thank you for that. And I suppose you're, you're still teaching remotely. Yes, it's been a very tricky, um, you know, 18 months or whatever teaching online. Yeah, it's, it's been challenging, but also it's been good in some ways because, you know, we've been forced to learn new techniques for teaching, new ways of engaging students. So um, that's been fun and difficult, although also working at home with children, as so many people know, that hasn't always been so easy. Um, and, you know, trying to homeschool all at the same time. But um, I've been lucky that my children are lovely, of course. Um, not that I'm biased, and have generally uh, enjoyed being at home together. Um, we've gotten more time together as a family, well, which is not to say that the that pandemic isn't a bad thing. So obviously it is, it's just that it's been enjoyable to be yeah. together a bit more. I think, especially as we're slowly coming out of it, I think we have to look back on the silver linings and some of the positives that we can take from this rather peculiar period in our modern history. Um, that's for sure. Um, and of course, it's been a big year, a big couple of years for, for activism, uh, or, just generally globally for sure and I think there's definitely some positives we can take from that too but I wanted to get into I'll get we'll get into activism but I know as a mother you don't have a huge amount of time at us today so we're gonna have to jump straight into it um so I, first of all I wanted to did want to ask though how how have you managed to to do so many different things simultaneously because you're, you're you're a professional teacher a scholar academic I know you're a published author I know you have another book coming out soon which we can get into too um, and then you also work as a, as a doula I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly um, <laughs> here you go um, so yeah how, how, do you, how do you manage all these different responsibilities I don't really <laughs> I mean I just you know like everybody else I just do the best I can I mean I'm very lucky because I have a lot of different jobs um, I always like to describe it as a patchwork quilt career. So I have a lot of different things that together make this beautiful quilt that is my life. Whereas I know some people prefer to have one thing that they really focus on. But for me, I find it really stimulating. Do little bits here and there and I just do the best I can. And to be honest, I always feel like I'm failing in some way because I'm, you know, I'm doing too much of the one thing, not enough of the other thing. I'm not enough time with the children. I'm not enough time, you know. It, it's just really tricky to find a balancing. Um, it, it is a balancing act and it's difficult to find the right balance. So, you know, every day is, is a new challenge. And I end up at the end of every day feeling a bit like I failed, but you know, we keep going. I know. Sure. Well, I mean, it's a diverse number of professions and roles that you have there. And I, and if, um, I would urge people as well just to go and check out your website. Just to tell us what that is real quick so people can, can jump on there after this. So you can find me at either bjepstein.com or I also use the last name of Woodstein, so bjwoodstein.com. I'm there. 
Brilliant. Okay, yeah. So I, I urge everyone to check that out because there's a lot more information there as well. And you, you did mention translation. And was did that come from when your time in Sweden? And 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 is, are you are you can you translate from multiple languages, or, or is Swedish and sort of Scandinavian your kind of forte? Yes, I mean I have studied other languages such as Spanish and Latin, but I basically translate from Swedish. Occasionally, do bits of Norwegian and Danish because you know, as you said, with Scandinavian, they're you know they're quite closely related, and so. I'm, I can't necessarily hold a conversation in Danish, but I could read a text in Danish. So, um, yeah, and it really did come about because I was living in Sweden. And as I said, I fell in love with Swedish literature and felt it was very different from what I was used to. And I started thinking to myself, what would it be like to make these books available in English? Um, what would readers in the US or the UK think of these Swedish books that are quite different? Uh, but I didn't know how to get started. And then somebody said to me, oh, you speak English um, as your native language. I've got a website. Could you translate my website from Swedish to English for me? And I thought, yeah, okay, sure, I can do that. And then they were very happy with that. And then they recommended me to somebody else. And then it kind of fell into place from there that I was starting to do more and more different um, translation tasks. And I found that I really love translation. Um, I always feel that kind of when I'm speaking Swedish, I'm a slightly different person than I am when I'm speaking English. And I really enjoy the kind of performative act of becoming um, the characters or the author and kind of feeling what they feel and trying to express that in English. So my most recent translation is actually going to be published tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, it's coming out. It's a children's book by, um, he's, he's called, we would say in English, David Sundin, S-U-N-D-I-N. And it's a great book. It's, it was the best-selling book in Sweden in 2020. And it's called The Book That Did Not Want to Be Read. Sure. And um, it's just a really funny book with a lot of wordplay. It was really difficult to translate. But, so yeah, that's coming out tomorrow, actually. Okay. Well, I assume people can find out more on your, on your website or just by, just by Googling. Um, and then that'll be up there. Do you, well, with, with, as a translator, do you do you mainly translate you know, children's literature then, or do you also focus on more academic texts, or, or or you know, like you say, websites? Is it is it is it anything, or is, do you have you have you sort of specialised? I've specialised now, but I've been doing it for you know almost twenty years, so it's been a long time. But when I started out, it was very much whatever anybody would give me, and so I was translating users' manuals. I was translating medical texts. I was translating financial reports. And those are not my um, specialist areas, shall we say. I learned a lot. I did not feel great passion for it. What I was always hoping that I was going to do was more literary work. So um, then I started to get asked to do you know, cookbooks. I really love food, very interested in food. So I did a bunch of cookbooks. I had some art books. I did people's PhD theses. You know, it was kind of all over the place. And now lucky enough to really be doing a lot of children's literature because I have a great passion for children's lit. I just really love books for children. So I'm really excited that I've been translating more and more of them. Wonderful. Well, I mean, as I say, I know we're on limited time, so I'm going to jump all over the place. But I wanted to ask you a few questions about, about being a doula, because first of all, can you just explain to the audience, for anyone who might not know, what a doula is and what, how, what, what kind of professional responsibilities that, that is? Um, and then I guess how that maybe fits in with, with your love of children's literature or your, you know, your own role as a mother. A doula, um, the word doula comes from the Greek word that means servant. So really, it's almost you are serving somebody who is pregnant and you serve the individual or if it's a couple, family, whatever, you serve them in, I usually just say, any kind of practical and emotional way that they need. So when they're pregnant, um, I might talk to them about preparing for birth, you know, positions for birth or um, what it's like to transition into becoming a parent, um, whatever questions they might have. You know, people have asked me all sorts of things like, can you can you teach us about cloth nappies, for example, <laughs> or uh, can you teach me about wearing my baby in a sling? Then you're with people during their birth um, and supporting them and the partner if there's a partner and helping them get comfortable and just helping them meet their own goals. So, you know, if they want to give birth without drugs, for example, helping support them to do that. And then anti, sorry, postnatally, you know, postpartum, it would be about, you know, helping them with the transition or helping them with breastfeeding, chest feeding, helping with um, taking care of the baby, learning to, you know, give the baby a bath, anything. I love it. It's rich. You know, birth um, is, I always call it a sort of everyday miracle because it happens all the time all over the world. And yet every time it's incredibly special to welcome this new person into the world. And for me, 
all my jobs fit together. I know they sound very disparate, my little patchwork quilt, but for me, they fit together because it's all about supporting people, making different voices heard. You know, it's easy when you are pregnant, for example, to feel very vulnerable and some doctor comes and tells you, you should do it this way. And you just say automatically, oh, okay, because you're the authority figure. And I feel my job is to help people find the power within themselves so that they can say, actually, this is what I want to do. Here's how I want to do it. And to feel that they're able to speak up for themselves. And that's, you know, very much about my my academic work as well, making sure everybody's voice is heard, making sure people feel that there's a place for them in our society. So I see it all as a very kind of activist. Um, we, all of my roles are very activist. Good and very practical, hands-on as well, but it sounds a bit too. And uh, it sounds like there must be a lot of mental health support or sort of almost like you're know, operating as a therapist as well, because it can often be quite traumatic, obviously, the, you know, the process. And, and, um, and so, yeah, there must be really interesting and a varied kind of uh, role. <laughs> keep, keep you busy, I imagine, too. Yeah, yeah, it is very much. I mean, and same with teaching, you know, is supporting people. And everybody has got a story and you never know what's going on with somebody. And so for me, it's about, we always talk about holding space, you know, letting people listen. I'm talking a lot today, but I try to listen a bit more when I'm, when I'm with people, whether they're my students or my doula clients. And yeah, and especially, you know, we were talking about the pandemic and in the past year, people have not received the support that they needed, partially because they couldn't get out and partially because so many things were closed down. And so we've seen more and more people needing just time. My students have really increased how much time they've needed. My doula clients, you know, they just, they need somebody who's there to help them through all these situations. I can see how all these things link up together. Um, definitely. Well, I mean, let's, well, let's move on as well, because one of the reasons I wanted to, to have you here today, of course, is to talk about your book that you published with Hammer On, um, Hammer On Press, who are, of course, a, a, now an imprint of intellect. But your book, I think, was, um, there she is, there you are. Now, your book was, I think, uh, first published in 2013, and Hammer On itself was founded by DM um, in year 2010, I believe. And then it became an imprint of intellect in 2020. And we're really loving the collaborative work that we're doing there. And they're just such a great partner for us. And we, we love the all the activist work that, that was produced and will continue to be produced. So it's just a fantastic press. So again, I urge everyone to check out Hammer On. Uh, if you just Google Hammer On Press, you, you can go find their, their website. And from there, you can also see BJ's book, which is, of course, called uh, Are the Kids All Right? Um, so there it is, simple covers as well. Um, so congratulations. Um, well, I guess we can say... Are you, Maybe it'll be a second edition at some point, but for now, let's talk about the existing one. Um, so tell us a little bit about the book. What, what's it all about and, 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 and why is it important? And, and how did you sort of stumble upon this as an idea? So I was, I mean, I'm queer myself and I have often in my life thought about representation in literature and wanting to see people like me. Um, when I was growing up, I... I'm from a Jewish family and I didn't really see very many Jewish children in children's literature and except if it was about the Holocaust. Um, and so I was always kind of looking for um, a mirror so that I could understand myself or know that I wasn't alone in my experiences. And the same was true when I gradually understood that I was, you know, LGBTQ. And so for me, I began to get very interested in what do we say to young people who are looking for reflections of their family life, for example, if they have two mothers or two fathers, or looking for reflections and ways of understanding themselves as they're coming to terms with their own gender identity or their own sexuality. So I just tried to read all the books that I could find that have been written in English that featured LGBTQ characters and analyze them to see kind of what tropes I was noticing or what messages we were sending readers. And I mean, 2013 doesn't feel that long ago, but obviously things have changed in the past eight years. You know, you mentioned a, a second edition. I think that probably that is something that I need to do to kind of really update the book on what has changed in the years since. But yeah, so I, I started reading all those books and tried to pull it together and then got in contact with DM, whose kind of activist approach really jived with my own. Um, yeah, that's, so that's how it went. Brilliant. Um, and you've, you've mentioned a few, well, actually first, let's go back to basics because um, first of all, how would you define children's literature? And, and is it possible to define queer literature or LGBTQ literature? And is it important to have definitions for, for, for things like that? 
it is, I mean, in some ways it is important to define, but also kind of impossible to define. Um, so with children's literature, sometimes people say, well, I would argue actually it's anything that's read by a child or a young adult, whether it was intended for them or not. Other people would disagree with me and say that, you know, it has to be specifically produced with children in mind. But if you look at some of the earliest stuff that we have, for example, fairy tales, they were often told, you know, woman to woman, and the children just happened to be nearby listening. They weren't told necessarily specifically for the children, although people were aware that the children were around listening. So I define children as anything that children and young adults read. Um, in terms of queer literature, I find that very difficult. It's something I think about a lot. You know, is it literature that is written by somebody who identifies as queer? But definitions change over time. Definitions are different in different cultures, different historical periods. So, you know, who are we to say if an author is LGBTQ or not? Is it about LGBTQ issues? But if it is, does that, you know, kind of limit it? So do we expect somebody who identifies as, say, a bisexual man to only write about bisexual topics? You know, so it's kind of unfair. So um, I, I guess it's a very tentative definition. I would say that my book is about people characters who identify as LGBTQ or who the author identifies as LGBTQ in some way. Um, well, you, I mean, you've alluded to the fact that a lot has potentially changed since 2013. Um, and so, well, first of all, what, what were your findings? You've, you've highlighted tr the sort of tropes and things that you, that you saw. What were the kind of findings of the work? Um, and then maybe we can get into how, what, what, what you found in terms of representation what before you published the book and then how you feel maybe representation has changed or evolved in the years subsequent to the book's publication. Um, so I found a lot of really interesting kind of repeated themes in the book. So one is that when they're gay male characters, often there'll be some sub theme about AIDS mm -hmm. as though, you know, HIV and AIDS always has to define a gay boy or gay man's life, um, which I find in sort of a problematic assumption. Um, with, similarly, when they're gay male characters, especially in young adult literature, they are shown as very sexual, as though, you know, they just can't keep their hands off each other all the time. Whereas queer female characters, they, the, at most, you see them holding hands. So it's like we are very uncomfortable with female sexuality and particularly queer female sexuality. Um, when I was doing the research in 2013, we were, well, well in the years before that, we weren't really seeing a lot of intersex or trans characters. So in my book, I talk about this kind of lack, especially of trans characters, but that has completely changed in the past few years. I mean, there's been an explosion of trans literature, some of it good, just like with any literature, some of it not so good. And what is not so good about some of the books and what I've found as one of my themes is that many of these books are quite pedagogical in approach. So I always want to see a queer character who's just kind of living their life. But many of these books seem to feel the urge to explain why somebody is LGBTQ or what their life looks like or that it's okay to be LGBTQ. And they often have kind of coming out stories as though that's the only thing that ever happens in your life when you're queer. And it's true, you know, you do come out and you kind of repeatedly have to come out to people, but that's definitely not the only thing that, um, that happens in the lives of people who are LGBTQ. So I guess I was quite negative in lots of ways back when I wrote the book, because I was feeling like, you know, we're just saying that an LGBTQ person, they come out, they have a hard life, they're probably rejected by their parents, probably rejected by friends, bullied in school, maybe have to leave their home, live homeless on the streets, can't have a happy, you know, relationship, a romantic relationship, and so on. And I just was really, really longing to see LGBTQ characters who were doing other things, who were, you know, making friends or joining the football team in school or, you know, thinking about what university to go to. I just wanted to see them living a fuller life. Do you feel like, I mean, I'm just trying to think back to my own childhood and, um, and, and, and the way I interpreted certain characters and things. I mean, I was born in 1983, so there we are. That puts that in perspective for you. Young. Uh, <laughs> so young. Still, 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 still clinging on to youth somewhere underneath these gray hairs. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was, it was it's the, the, the characters that I encountered. First of all, it was often um, young homosexual male characters. Um, and that there were a lot of stereotypes 
Now, let, just to talk about more, put more of a positive spin on it as well, is do you feel that we are getting beyond those stereotypes? I know you've just highlighted some of the, the sort of more normative narratives of, that, that, that are placed upon people from LGBTQ backgrounds. But um, is, there, is, there, is, there, is there, in your new edition, will you be celebrating? You know, will, is, there, is there much to celebrate? I think so. I mean, I think things have improved a lot. And, um, you know, I think that we need the kind of negative and coming out stories because that is part of life. And that was much more common, you know, in the 1980s, 1990s. Um, and that, that's sad, but that did reflect reality for some or even many people. But I think we are starting to move beyond that, not quite as quickly as I would like, to be honest, <laughs> but maybe I, I want change to happen too quickly. But I would like to see um, more, for example, what I feel is still missing is intersectionality, by which I mean that the books might feature a queer character, but they're almost always white. They're almost always from a sort of Christian or what I call the sort of nominally Christian background, you know, where they celebrate Christmas and Easter and so on. Um, nearly always middle class, nearly always able bodied, nearly always, you know, nice kind of average size frame and I just kind of feel you know we're all so many things and I'd like to see you know the book with somebody who is a different size different kinds of abilities you know there's they might be queer but they also are so many other things and so we're still we're still not there yet but we have improved as I said you know we've seen this explosion of trans lit um I was complaining a little bit about queer female sexuality in in young adult books. And I think that we are seeing a bit more of that as though we're kind of relaxing and noticing that actually queer women can really, you know, enjoy sexual interactions with each other. And in terms of picture books, there's so many picture books with two moms or two dads or a trans parent now. And that's really exciting to see. Previously, a lot of the books were about, um, you know, the basic storyline would be a kid goes to nursery or to school and the other children go, hey, you've got two mothers. Where's your dad? And the kid suddenly goes, oh, uh, where's my dad? I don't know. Um, and goes home and asks the mothers, why do I not have a dad? And they, and they explain, you know, as, as, and explaining to the, to the reader at the same time. And they say, but our family is just as good as a family with one mother and one father. And then the kid dutifully goes back to school and says, my mother say, this is how my family was made with these seeds from some nice man and our family's just as good. And they, those stories were really boring to read. You know, they were just pedagogical, just confirming that you're okay. I'm okay. You're okay. You know, there was no, there was no plot to them. Yeah. And now okay. we're seeing lovely, you know, picture books where it's, you know, they have two parents, but actually it's something else. I mean, there was one that, um, that I saw just a couple of weeks ago where it's a kid who's got two mothers the point is that they're pirates and that's what's embarrassing to the child, you know, and that's lovely to see that it's, it's just kind of coincidental. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think they go going back to the, the mirror as well. You talked about earlier on, um, you know, and, and it's, it's not the only thing that determines your personality, right? There's so many different like parts to us. Um, before we continue, I did just want to give anyone out there who's listening an opportunity to um, type in any questions for BJ. Um, BJ will be with us for maybe another 10 minutes before it's, before it's bedtime for the kids, I believe. So um, this is a great opportunity if anyone does have any specific questions. Um, but um, I also wanted to, I've got a question here. Actually. It, it's, you've kind of answered all my questions about intersectionality. And I, I think that's really fascinating and very interesting. And I also, speaking to a few friends, they were also suggesting that that was something that was very interesting to them, whether that's, that's changed. Um, and, uh, and, and I've seen a lot of that in work that we've done at Intellect in comic books. So like black trans characters in comic books, for example, uh, mm -hmm. just something I was reading the other day. But I mean, I'm sure that's obviously much more diverse across all different cultural mediums now. Um, but I would say the, oh, sorry, I was just going to say that in response to that, I think that there's this feeling that people underestimate children. So they think that children can't handle, you know, two aspects to an identity or children can't handle learning about something. And that's really an issue from adults. It's not an issue for children. Children are so accepting. And, you know, people say, oh, children don't see color. And that's not true. I think children are very aware of it, but it doesn't matter to them until we teach them that it does. Similarly, you know, my, my children, they tell their friends they've got two mothers and their friends are just like, OK, yeah, you know, whatever. It's not it doesn't matter to them. They just accept it as normal. And so I think 
places like comic books, graphic novels, fantasy, science fiction, they tend to be a lot more flexible than, um, for example, children's literature, because people really underestimate children's literature, children, and they try to protect children through what they publish for children. Well, this, uh, this, uh, someone actually asked me as well to, to, to mention to you whether you thought children gain a lot of information from literature from kids stories and I mean and for me personally I, just, I remember that was a, a huge world view for me um, through characters and the imagination of placing yourself in there so I mean I assume you probably kind of feel the same way that they certainly do. Yeah definitely I mean I think we used the term mirrors before and I also like to think about the opposite the windows and so looking out the window looking at somebody else somebody else's life somebody else's perspective and you know we only have our one life and so I only really understand things, you know, intimately from my own perspective, you know, from the experiences that I had growing up where I did in my situation, my family and so on. But literature was the way that I could learn that other people are not actually that other, you know, they're not that different from me. We have the same concerns. You know, we might have a different sexuality, a different gender identity, different ethnicity, different religion, whatever. But we have so much in common and literature helped me learn that. And also literature taught me about other people's holidays or the foods that somebody eats in a different country. And so it's not weird, you know, it's just great information and it makes me feel closer to other people. And literature is just so important for that reason. Um, well, we've got a couple of questions. I'll come back to, to, to this as well. But so we just had a question come in from uh, Ammo Expression. And if you can see that one there, but have you seen Latinx queer stories? Um, no, I haven't. I need to look into that. That sounds that sounds good. If you have a, is that the name of the title of a book, or is it? I, I, I would just be interested to find out more. Well, um, Ammo Expression, if you want to follow up on that, feel free to drop another comment. In. But I think um, stories relating to people who identify as Latinx queer, I suppose. Yeah. Um, you know, there have been very few um, Latinx characters in children's and young adult literature, and. I saw the most depressing statistic um, not long ago, probably in the last year, that there are more books for children and young adults that feature animals than there are that feature um, minorities, people of color. Um, and that is just shocking and depressing, not surprising. Uh, okay, I got you. I, got, I saw the comment now. Um, so there's a need. I mean, there might be some that I'm simply not familiar with, but from what I do know of this stuff that's kind of published by mainstream publishers, I feel that that's a real gap in the market. And that relates to all sorts of power issues in terms of who is getting published. You know, all sorts of people write books, but do the agents and the publishers take them on? And what are they thinking about? You know, are they thinking about the bottom line? Are they concerned that, you know, certain readers wouldn't read something that features a particular type of character? I mean, it's very problematic, all these kind of power issues involved in publishing. Yeah, nothing. I mean, I can't, I can only speak about on academic publishing and that's certainly something that we've seen across the industry. And of course, it's something that we're trying to, to deal with um, and to, to make improvements on for sure. And I think that's one of the reasons, again, why Hammer On is such an important, um, an important press because of course that's the main focus is breaking down these barriers and, um, you know, increasing inclusivity through activism and through affecting actual change. I think it's really important that there are presses like that um, um, who can sustain themselves. And, you know, the books are also very affordable. I think your book is, is uh, £10, you know, so that's very affordable by contemporary standards for a book, which are ultimately is fairly academic in its dealing of things. Um, so no, yeah, that's always a good thing. Well, ac yes, academic, but written excessively. And that's what mattered to me so that anybody can read it and that you don't have to feel like it's going to be some jargon filled text. That's just all, you know, heavy literary theory. Ooh. It's all backed by research and literary theory, but it is written in a way anybody can read. That was my aim. Well, otherwise it's not going to be inclusive by any stretch of the imagination, is it? No. I think that's something mm -hmm. we strive for. And I think people who are writing, um, whatever the subject may be, I think that's an important tip that often goes astray is that, you know, it doesn't have to be complex um, or alienating to be important or deemed academically rigorous. You know, it, the, the more accessible and succinct something is, the better, I would, I would argue anyway, from my, with my editorial. I totally agree with you. 
Yeah. <laughs> I had a pretty cool question come in again earlier on, which I wanted to ask you. So this is from a friend of mine, um, and they also work in, in sort of LGBTQ queer studies and stuff. So um, but it was uh, the question is: Do kids' books often use anthropomorphized? Here we go. Do kids' books often use anthropomorphized animals or fantastic creatures to depict queerness? And how does this affect representation? You've kind of alluded to that, saying that there's actually more an animal animalized characters than there are people from you know non-white race and stuff so yeah do you want to talk on that for a minute yes um your friend is absolutely right that they do often use animals creatures um non-human uh characters basically and i think that part of the reason is that it's thought that children can relate more easily to a bear or whatever the animal might be a penguin because you don't see color um in the same way you don't look at a bear and think oh you belong to this religion or this ethnic group um, and again, I think this is where people are kind of underestimating children uh, because they're acting like children couldn't see a character who's different from them and still relate to them. And children can and do. Um, so I find it a bit problematic. I also know that everybody likes animals. Um, you know, animals are very traditional in children's literature from, you know, the earliest Aesop's fables where we have these kind of stereotyped ideas about animals. We've always been using animal characters, you know, even, oh, horse stories are, you know, very popular. I mean, you just see them all over the place in, in children's lit and, and other kinds of literature. Um, I think that using animals as a shortcut for otherness mm -hmm is a little bit lazy at times. I understand there are reasons for it, but I do feel like actually we could have more human characters. And I think that it might be harder actually for some readers to relate to say a penguin than to another human person. That being said, um, penguins, like I've mentioned twice now, and they are particularly common in queer picture books. It's very funny. Um, you find a lot of gay penguins. And I think that's because of the famous story from New York. I know you're, you're in New York and from the zoo, I think it was the Bronx Zoo, where there were two male penguins that adopted an egg and took care of it together. They sadly broke up um, sometime later, but, but at any rate, it was a story that kind of captured people's imaginations for a while. And so there were a whole bunch of books written about gay penguins for a period of time there. Um, and yeah, uh, but I do find it a bit problematic. Um, uh, so there's my friend Disneyana. Thank you very much for, for the question. Um, I, it definitely intrigued me. I'm glad we've been able to talk about that uh, today. I know we're, we're running out of time now, so I did want to just ask a couple questions. What, um, what children's books do, do you and your wife read to your own children? Um, and is there any, any specifically LGBTQ literature that you read to them or, or, just, or just books in general? Anything that you want to highlight? So I really like the um, picture books by Leslie Newman. Uh, she was one of the first people to write a queer picture book. She wrote um, Heather Has Two Mommies, which was, you know, uh, in the 1980s and got really famous, was very controversial and so on. Um, and it was a bit pedagogical in style, but her more recent work, I feel, really gets to what I was talking about earlier, just featuring, you know, queer families getting on with their lives so two moms two dads whatever the setups and just going on so we read those because I think it's important for my children to see representations of their own family life in children's books and to know that there are lots of other people out there who have two moms or maybe who have two dads or other family setups um, but in general I will read anything that the children want to read sometimes that means that I'm reading some dreadful schlock at bedtime um, you know, because we say you go to the library or the bookstore, you can pick anything you like. And when you say that, then you have to follow through on that. Um, so, but my one thing is that I will not um, buy any books anymore that do not feature strong female characters. I have, I mean, we've got lots of stuff that has boy characters and people have given us or that, you know, we've bought over time. But I have two daughters and it's really important for me to feel that they feel empowered and that they know they can do anything in their lives. So they can get anything they want from the library. They can take anything they want from school. I'll read it happily, read it with them or be told about it if they want to, you know, if the older one wants to read it on her own. But if we're going to buy it, it, I want to see strong female characters and I want to see intersectionality wherever possible. And so... You know, we are maybe the annoying parents who always give books as presents for her people's birthdays, but I always make a point of, you know, choosing books that I think that other people might um, might enjoy um, that have strong characters and that tackle some of these issues that, that are important to me, the anti-racism, the, you know, supportive of LGBTQ 
um, topics, the different levels of ability, different types of ability, all of that is really important to me. Well, that's clearly like grassroots activism, isn't it, from the ground up there as well. And it sounds like you're going to have either a pair of authors or a pair of publishers or one of the two <laughs> somewhere down the line in the future. So good luck with that. Um, um, just, yeah, I suppose then we've, I know we've run out of time really. So just finally, um, you mentioned the book that you've translated, um, which is coming, coming out tomorrow. Um, are you working on anything else and can we expect anything else from you in the near future? Yeah, so I have got a sort of follow up to the book with Hammer On, um, and it is about international queer children's literature. And I've co edited it with um, an academic at uh, the University of Sheffield called um, Elizabeth Chapman. And it is coming out this summer with um, Anthem Press. And basically, what we did was we asked scholars around the world to write a chapter about what was going on in their language or their culture in regard to queer children's lit. And it has been fascinating. We've been working on it since 2017, I think. So it's been a long process. And what we discovered was that people in some countries were not willing to write for us. They said the political situation was too challenging. They wouldn't put their name to anything. Sometimes people, for example, we had the scholar in Mongolia who agreed to write a chapter and then backed out because they got too nervous about it. Um, there were some, we have nothing from Africa, which was really upsetting. We had somebody who said they might write and then in the end also felt uncomfortable with it. Um, we have a chapter on the Arab world, so it's a whole chapter for all the diversity in the Arab world, but the person wouldn't put their name to it. So they provided us with notes, and we had to paraphrase it, and it talks about kind of the situation there. Um, we had loads of people who said, all right, I'm in Australia, I'm in New Zealand, and we were going, well, we'd really like to see about other languages than English, so we don't have... Um, a real focus on English. It's very much about what's happening in other countries. We've got Brazil, um, you know, my specialty is Sweden. We actually have two chapters on Sweden. We've got um, the Philippines. Uh, I mentioned the Arab world. We've got, you know, Italy, Spain, Germany, France, kind of some of the usual suspects. Um, yeah, and I'm really excited about it because we gather together some very interesting scholars, some of whom also write literature for children and are just telling us what's going on in their country and what the state of queer literature is. And I have to say that even though I've been kind of critical today about what I've seen in queer children's lit, working on this new book has made me realize how lucky we are in English. Mm -hmm. So in the UK and the US, we have so many rights. You know, it's not perfect by any means and we still have to keep fighting, but we do have a lot of rights and we also have a lot of literature. There are countries where queer people cannot get married or they cannot be openly queer, they cannot adopt children or get fertility treatment or, you know, the list goes on and they're not able to get their books published. And some there's some the chapter that's on India, for example, I mean, India is a huge country, but they're talking about how most of the literature they have there has been imported mm. from English speaking countries. People are not feeling confident doing homegrown literature. Um, so I have to kind of I kind of want to end on this positive note that we're really lucky in the UK and the US, even though there are things that could be improved still. Well, that's wonderful. And that's fascinating. And I can't wait to uh, to read the book when it comes out. So keep an eye out for that, everybody. Um, I just want to say, BJ, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really interesting. Um, and good luck with all of these different um, plates you've got spinning. But um, I'm, I'm <laughs> and, and prolific author. So looking forward to reading these two new books. Um, and again, if you want to find out more about BJ's work, you can go uh, and visit intellectbooks.com or you can go to, to hammeron.com as well. Um, just also to highlight, we are again, we're celebrating Hammeron this week and it's the, the end of Pride Month. So there is a lot of free material available through www.intellectbooks.com. So lots of different perspectives uh, covering all, all, all aspects of culture. So do go and check that out. There's a lot of really cool things there. So we're trying to widen, you know, sort of, again, trying to boost inclusivity and widen access to a lot of these different voices. So go and try and check out some of that stuff. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And BJ, thank you so much. Um, I hope there's an interesting book for you to be reading to the kids tonight. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Any final words from you? Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoy talking about this topic, and I'm really pleased that people are interested in it. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to see what books Intellect and Hamron will be publishing next as well. Me too. It's an exciting time. So everyone keep an eye out on that too. Um, thank you so much again, BJ. Have a great day. And thank you for all your contributions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, yeah. everyone.